The Witcher 3 is a hard game to review. First of all, it's absolutely gigantic. Even rushing through the main story essentially amounts to a short guided tour of the Northern Kingdoms, a light introduction to each region, but not much else. It's important for me to mention this, because there really is so much here that it's hard to discuss everything this game has to offer in the time I've been given to play it. Furthermore, I'm almost as passionate about these games as the developers themselves, a passion which shines through the technical shortcomings and near impenetrable lore of the first two games. But that's all in the past. The Witcher 3 has arrived as the flagship, open world, whatever other buzzwords you like, next gen title. Impressively, this passion and attention to detail have now been paired with an accessible plot, nuanced crafting, leveling and upgrade systems, and one of the most stunning virtual worlds I've had the pleasure of exploring. And what a massive world it is. Like any open world game, the explorable regions of Velen, Novigrad, and the Skellig Isles really are the stars of The Witcher 3. Despite the marketing hype, the game is more structurally similar to the first two Witcher games than a traditional open world, as the map is divided into several distinct subzones, each with their own storylines, politics, and characters. So although the world isn't completely open, what is there has been lovingly crafted and considered. The Northern Kingdoms have been conquered, and now fall under the banner of the southern land of Nilfgaard. The rich and poor alike desperately try to align themselves in the new political landscape, and bloodthirsty monsters creep onto the smouldering battlefields from their mountains, caves, and forests. As soon as you set foot in the gentle groves of White Orchid, you'll get a real sense of these conflicts and the politics that have shaped this world, even if you're completely new to the series. Children are chastised for singing simple songs which discredit the new emperor, and resistance to the Nilfgaardian regime can be found in everything from community notice boards to the decor of a country inn. CD Projekt have put a great deal of love and attention into the natural environments as well. Trees and grass constantly shift and bend in the wind, which can range from a gentle breeze to powerful gusts. The lighting in particular is outstanding, easily the best I've seen in a game. From the dramatic sunbeams of a setting sun to the soft moonlight illuminating the forests and fields by night, the way it paints and sculpts the world is quite incredible. Combined with the wind and weather effects, the world feels wild, dynamic and dangerous. It's a thrilling world to explore as well, due to a strong art direction that makes some really clever set dressing, like an old ruin in the middle of a lake or a mysterious forest trail. This sense of composition and narrative have always been a key part of CD Projekt's environment design, and it's great to see that philosophy return here. Although the game shares environments with the first Witcher title, the Skellig Isles are as different to the previous spaces as they could be, and are some of the most delightfully subtle and restrained virtual landscapes I've visited. Of course, even the most stunning open world isn't going to be much without something to fill it, and throughout your playthrough you'll find yourself doing side quests, crafting gear, experimenting with potions, hunting for treasure, playing card games, navigating dialogue options, and of course, hunting monsters. The design, animation, and sound effects these creatures exhibit totally grounds them in the world they inhabit, as pests, wild beasts, and even the subject of local fairy tales. More often than not, you'll find yourself having to sift through local superstitions, rumours, and hearsay to determine which species of monster you're dealing with, or even if there's one involved at all. A jealous lover is just as likely to be the culprit as a wraith or drowner. Your investigation will usually lead you to the site of a recent attack, where you hunt around for clues using your Witcher senses, a kind of detective mode eagle vision mechanic which highlights pertinent clues in the environment. These sections of the game are relatively open compared to the aforementioned examples, but are still a little artificial, as Geralt can only see certain clues when the designer wants you to. To. This time around, you'll also find your journal will be an invaluable monster hunting tool. With it, you'll soon be able to read the landscape, assessing danger and spawning useful alchemy ingredients. Not to sound too much like a marketing hook, but it really does add to the feeling of being a witcher, which is enhanced by engaging wholeheartedly with the various systems the game throws at you. Nothing beats the careful research, planning, skill, and ultimate rush of defeating a particularly tough monster. This is never as simple as swinging your sword either. Each monster has specific strengths and weaknesses detailed in their beastry entry. This section of the journal not only tells you which spells, potions, bombs, and oils are effective against a particular monster, but the written description will often give you clues as to what time of day you're most likely to spot one, or a useful strategy for defeating it. It's worth bumping up the difficulty if you don't plan on rushing through the game as well, as it will often force you to make some inspired strategic choices, such as making wide attack sweeps on horseback, or depleting an enemy's stamina bar to make their dodging and blocking less effective. This is a rare game where a high difficulty adds to the experience, rather than pads it. The Witcher 3 is balanced well, even if you don't make the jump to higher difficulties, and can still provide a meaningful challenge. Combat requires careful preparation through both alchemy and crafting, as well as sharp timing, blocking, and dodging during a fight. There are some neat tweaks here to make combat more enjoyable as well, such as the way Geralt will rotate around an enemy, or how he will automatically draw the correct sword for the type of enemy he's facing. Each monster has also been carefully designed with a separate strategy in mind, 
Like previous games, Geralt's combat prowess can be improved by leveling up, applying mutagens, and upgrading your weapons through blacksmithing and collecting glyphs. It's in these upgrade systems that the game's longevity becomes apparent. It's just as easy to get gleefully lost gathering ingredients, crafting armor, and finding that one perfect leveling path as it is exploring the world or hunting monsters. As enjoyable as the game is though, there are some issues. I encountered a couple of cutscenes without sound, one of them pretty important, as well as jittery doors and objects, and some broken escort quests. A lot of these problems are slowly being cleaned up by CD Projekt's excellent post-launch support though, so don't agonize over it too much. There are also some tired fantasy tropes that the game stubbornly holds onto though, including an abundance of Cockney accents and Caucasian faces. If this is a problem for you, it is something to be aware of. Just before release, the game was slammed for the way it treats women, accusations which are mostly unfounded in my opinion. There are no quota-filling strong women in The Witcher 3. There are complicated, messy, brave, manipulative, cheery, grim, noble people. There are victims and aggressors. From day one, The Witcher has depicted a world which is anything but black and white, and it's a mistake to try to force it into that binary. The lack of people of colour is a problem, but there are some really respectful, mature moments peppered throughout, dealing with homosexuality, gender fluidity, and race relations. As one of the few mainstream games actually engaging with these issues, The Witcher 3 should be commended, not condemned. I'll admit, I do feel slightly uncomfortable just shoveling praise onto a video game like this, but I really do believe that The Witcher 3 deserves most of it. It's a complicated, dangerous, and massive experience. Despite a few technical issues, it remains a world you can completely lose yourself in. Whether it's in the plot, quest design, spectacular environments and lighting, or its various combat and upgrade systems. Just when you think you've got a handle on The Witcher 3, it shows you something or somewhere totally new, opening up even more than you thought it could, and showing you just how little you know about it. It draws you completely into its world, one that you'll be more than happy to get lost in.